the other element that I think is even more important, uh, of which drone warfare is part, is the fact that the battlefield has become transparent, meaning that both sides, by drones, but also by a number of other satellites, Ukrainian through Western uh, uh, Western assets, um, space-based assets like satellites, but also ground-based assets, um, and the Russian as well, have a, such a clear picture of what the opponent is doing that basically you can do nothing. You can't surprise your opponent anymore. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I got a quite unconventional talk for you because I got with me a fellow YouTube host who doesn't talk much about politics, but is an expert or a geek in his own words on military hardware. I'm talking to Augusto Aldegi, who is the host of the Millennium Seven Star YouTube channel that keeps producing high quality videos about military technology, especially in the realm of aerospace. Agosto got his degree in aeronautical engineering from the Polytechnic Institution of Milan. Uh, he did his military service in the Italian Air Force and then worked for a short while in the aerospace industry, after which he, his professional career took him into IT and management consulting. But nonetheless, he is a self-described massive aerospace nerd, which is why he does his channel. And you know me, I'm more of a pacifist at heart, so I don't like military gear very much. But for the sake of uh, analysis, it is important to know what exists, what is being produced, and what the pitfalls are, since those technical aspects um, are some of the factors that determine the development of military and security policies. So, uh, Augusto, uh, thank you very much for coming online today. Thank you very much for the invite. That's a flattering introduction. You deserve it. You really create wonderful content, and I uh, rec uh, recommend everybody check it, checking it out because you talk about uh, about airplanes very much. And that's my first question already because I never actually really understood the the the, the aerospace aspect, especially of the current war in Ukraine that we are seeing. And um, you know, in a recent video, one of the things that I found fascinating was that you said that the F sixteen that is being talked so much about and, you know, the F-16s that are supposed to go to Ukraine and being flown by Ukrainian pilots. And I think they just finished the training of a couple of pilots. Um, but you said the F-16s would be quite useless to Ukraine. Can you explain to us why that is? So it wasn't actually me. It was a high Ukrainian official, an officer of the Ukrainian Air Force, who said that the F-16s at this point were not so useful as they would have been if they had arrived for the summer offensive. And the rationale behind that was uh, that with the F-16, they could uh, have exerted at least some limited forms of air power, which they can do now. So the air war in Ukraine has been characterized by, uh, like in the ground, of a certain degree of paralysis um, because the uh, surface-based air defenses had demonstrated to be so effective that pretty much deny each other airspace to the two contendants. The Ukraine are at disadvantage because their air force was smaller than the Russian and technologically at least 20 years backwards. But it and the Russian also had a very a number of very long range weapons like cruise missiles and the ballistic missiles that could be used to hit these key targets in uh, in in the in the, in the, in the Western Ukraine. But nonetheless, the Ukrainian. Um, ground-based air defenses, and uh, particularly with the use of some uh, particularly clever tactics, have been uh, very effective, and the Russians ha rarely venture beyond the area that they actually occupy on the ground, which is, again, for the Russian is not particularly a problem because the range of the weapons that they have is uh, such that they can sort of sanitize 
an area about 100 kilometers deep inside Ukraine, behind Ukrainian lines, where it's almost impossible, or very, very difficult for the Ukrainians to fly. What the F-16 would have done was A, well, add an interesting, uh, a bit more in numbers, uh, B, uh, being slightly more modern than the than what the Ukrainian do have, they would have been slightly less sensitive uh, than the Ukrainian uh, present inventory to the uh, Russian weapons. They would have, may have had a better chances of surviving, and they could uh, be used, for example, to gather uh, local air superiority above the area of the offensive which in the NATO doctrine is the basically the prerequisite for doing anything. The, the, the One of the key problems uh, of the offensive in, in, in the summer of 2023 was the fact that the Ukrainians at the beginning tried to operate like NATO forces um, do, uh, using movement rather than attrition. But this actually implies that the defendant is already being uh, um, has been or uh, the, the defendant needs to be uh, uh, attracted by the air power by air power and uh, so air power is the key component of the NATO doctrine the American doctrine basically if you don't, don't have air superiority at least local air superiority nothing moves the Ukrainian tried to tried to do the same and they failed in a few days. Uh, they reverted back to classic, more reasonable tactics, uh, consider the situation on the ground and then managed to do some progress, very little progress to be honest, but uh, they managed to do some progress, but still they didn't have any form of air superiority. The F-16 may have, might have given them uh, this kind of uh, uh, local air superiority that could have improved that. Now, in the uh, uh, while the Russians are uh, have the initiatives, and um, the F-16s are probably not as useful um, because, technologically speaking, the these aircraft are quite old, and uh, the um, Russians still have a. Um, technological superiority margin. There's still a bet, a worse customer for the Russians than what the Ukrainians already have. They're definitely more dangerous for the, for the Russians, but not as much to compromise the capability of the Russian Air Force to create this sanitized area and for the, also to use the, the ground attack component to hit the um, Ukrainian forces on uh, on the battle line. So that's the reason why they are not mm, they are not considered that useful now. There's still a political statement, to be honest, because probably more ground-based air defenses would have been better for them. But uh, the military effectiveness is... Uh, probably not at the top. How, and the reason why they, did, they didn't get the, 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 that air force, in, uh, that force in, uh, in this new NATO-style air force in 2023 is because uh, it is extremely difficult to create uh, an air force from scratch. Mm -hmm. For example, the Polish that actually adopted the F-16 um, many years ago, it took six years from the beginning of the program to have the first limited capabilities and about 10 years to have the full capability capabilities. Of course, in the war, in, in war you can cut some corners, but if you cut some corners is, uh, yeah, you also risk compromising uh, the, the effectiveness of, of the systems. There are, um, we speak a lot about the pilots, but there is, uh, the, there are, uh, billion of of, of, of of elements that needs to be considered. For example, do the Ukrainian reserves of consumables, oil, uh, hydraulic fuels, and this kind of things, compatible with Western aircraft? 
or see these are american aircraft all the tools which imp with the, the, the the tools that they are used to maintain them are imperial the ukrainian have metric tools so there's a myriad of situations like this that need to be over needs to be considered and need to be resolved before you get to the full, full um, to the full capability of the weapon that's the reason why it's taking so long so details over details um, but still at the same time uh, if i if i got it right one of the one of the talking points is that uh, the f16s could be equipped with tactical nuclear weapons um, and the russians actually acknowledged that and said that they would treat f-16s like a nuclear threat um so we see that the russians take uh, at least in what they say they take the f-16s very serious um can you do you have any more ideas of why that is or is this on both sides more of a political talking point rather than an actual operational issue at least on the russian side i mean uh, they, apparently they wouldn't be that shouldn't be that afraid of the f-16s right um, I believe that they are not particularly afraid. They, they take them seriously, obviously, but they don't think that they are particularly afraid. Um, uh, yes, it's true that the F-16s are certified to drop uh, gravity nuclear weapons, but obviously to drop one, you need to have one. And no, sorry, <laughs> sorry, gravity means just go and drop, uh, not... Yeah, a conventional, no a conventional weapon a that... Has, falls out of the uh, aircraft by gravity and flies in free flight, is not guided mm. and hit the target. A dumb so, nuclear bomb. A dumb nuclear bomb, exactly. In um, um, Obviously, Ukraine has none of those, so they're not in immediate, in immediate menace. And again, if you want to employ them, you need to train the pilots, train the ground personnel, train and so on. Uh, which for nuclear weapons is not simple. Uh, the, so I think is more political posturing from this point of view, and probably gives them gives the Russian a justification to eventually to hit the F-16 wherever they see them. Uh, I still don't think that they will try to hit them when they were outside the borders of Ukraine. But this maybe is leaving a door open for such an operation. But one thing that I am actually concerned is the fact that uh, the F-16s will need to fly in and out of Ukraine for maintenance. And um, so uh, th this is this is something that Ukrainians already do with a lot of Western equipment. They don't have the time to set up a full logistic chain within the Ukraine. So basically, all the maintenance, all the big maintenance is done either in Poland or in Romania. Uh, if they do the same for the F-16 with the aircraft flying from Poland, landing in Ukraine, being armed and doing a, a, a war mission, a full, a full mission, then it becomes quite difficult to justify the fact that there are no direct military action, for example, from the Polish territory because the aircraft flew from Poland, made a stop, and then uh, and then made the mission. I am really afraid that at some point to keep the aircraft operational, they will resort to doing that um, because they can't do everything in Ukraine. And uh, this could be potentially very escalatory in my point of view, because at that point, the Russians will have an incentive to hit the facilities in Poland that maintain the aircraft. But is it, uh, there was, I, I remember there was also the idea that these aircraft could actually be fully, like, could start from Poland and fly over Ukraine and then fly missions in, like, combat missions and then go back and be landed actually in Poland again. Is something like that thinkable or would it, like, would the, the starting and landing to go from and to missions always happen from Ukrainian territory? But I believe that that would give the Russians the perfect excuse to hit the, the bases in Poland or in Romania or in wherever the, these aircraft are flying from, which I believe is very, very escalatory. From what I've heard, what they're trying to do is to have a, a self-contained operation in Ukraine. Uh, but as I said, it's very difficult. It takes a long time. 
I don't see how they could do that, at least without civilian contractors, which are actually normally used by all the Western Air Forces. The F-16 is a very right, common aircraft. Thousands have been built. A lot of Air Forces use, use the, this aircraft, so there are plenty of civilian contractors uh, specializing in maintenance for these uh, aircraft, and they are used by all, pretty much all the Air Forces the, in the West. It's, it's a normal practice. I don't see how the Ukrainian could do that, at least without those. And the worst case could be, and there have been proposals, to bring in, um, for example, retired American personnel to to do the maintenance in uh, directly in Ukraine, or retired American pilots to fly the aircraft, the aircraft in uh, in Ukraine. Again, this is quite escalatory. Yeah, it is escalatory. It's it's very very dangerous. Um, do you have any idea why it is? I mean, because you said like um, bringing military equipment back to Poland and Romania for repair, and then back into Ukraine for use, it has been quite normal with ground, also ground offensive uh, equipment, I suppose tanks and so on. Uh, why is it that the Russians have never systematically destroyed all the railway lines and all the major roads uh, leading to Romania and Poland? Does that make any um, difference? They actually did. They did. What, what they could, in the in the sense the bridges and the roads um, going into uh, Romania, because they were more vulnerable to an attack because they... Uh, because there are the mountains, the Carpathians are in part of the border, so there, there's a limited number of roads and a number of narrow passages and valleys, so there are bridges, uh, viaducts, and so on. Those have been uh, systematically attacked for a time. Um, in the, the the border with Poland is, uh, is, uh, is probably not worth it because the roads and the railroads are actually targets that are easy to repair if they are hit. So you are launching a cruise missile that is worth various millions to make a hole on, on the ground uh, in on, on a road or a railway that can be repaired in a day or two. So it's probably not worth it. So that's the reason why they're not attacking. And they don't have intelligence capability of actually tracking the individual convoys that move the move the move the the hardware back and forth so uh, so they, they they sort of didn't it's the same uh, reason why the bridges on the Dnieper are, are still on because they most of them are not really bridges most of them are actually dams uh so uh again it's a target that is very very difficult to to hit from the air from the air with, with from long distance and if it's a dam it would come with downstream literally downstream uh damage that probably yeah exactly but for getting to that point you will need a yeah. lot yeah. of uh, a lot of hits okay the oh. dam in nova, the dam in nova kakovka was different because apparently it was mined Still not sure who actually blew blew it blew it up because the 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 the, the dam that then you know the water that then uh, uh, created much more problems for the Russians than the Ukrainians. But the narrative still is the Russians blew it up because exactly. they always so, they love blowing up their own uh, like the power plant, right? The power plant yeah, exactly. that both it's sides are currently yeah. attacked, even those Russians inside, like that kind of thing. Okay, um, let me ask you another another question that has been on my mind. I think if I if I if I remember correctly, Switzerland decided to buy F thirty fives from the, the, the US. They did, right? Um, why would you give F sixteens to Ukraine if F thirty fives are around? What's the difference between these aircrafts? And what happened with F seventeen to F thirty four? What why what's the naming there? I I, I always wondered. So the, the the start from the second. So F something means fighter and the number, which is the American system to classify platforms. Mm -hmm. So the, the actually every number from 16 
They started with F1, to be honest, in the 60s at some point. I don't remember the exact date because they got to F100 and uh, something. So they started from the beginning um, in, in the 60s. So all the, all the numbers have been occupied, but some of them were just projects that never brought, never came to life. Some of them are actual aircraft. After the F-16, the, the F-17 was a prototype. The F-18 is an aircraft of the U.S. Navy. The F-19, I don't know. The F-20 was a, a light fighter that never was was not successful, was never sold. Um, there is an F-22, which is which is a fight, which is um, which is a stealth fighter, air superiority fighter, and. Uh, so it, keep, it keeps going, <laughs> the F-35. The F-35 um, is the most modern in the Western uh, US and NATO, but also other, let's say, Western aligned countries are uh, inventory. And uh, it is being produced right now. It's probably the combat aircraft that is being produced in larger numbers today. Uh, Probably the J, the Chinese J twenty gets close, but the F thirty five is currently being produced amidst a billion of problems. It's a very controversial uh, program, but the aircraft in itself is excellent. The program was really badly managed. The F thirty five, you mean? Yeah, the F thirty five. So it happens that Norway, Denmark, Belgium, and the Netherlands are actually all replacing their F-16s with F-35s. So the F-16s were actually available for uh, to, to be donated to, to Ukraine. So they are all old aircraft. I mean, the F-16 first flew 50 years ago. The, 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 the European aircraft are younger, obviously, but they are not young. They are all... Uh, they're all uh, airframes with uh, quite old airframes. They still have some plenty of hours left, flight hours left in them, but they uh, they obviously not modern. And the technology in the aircraft is not that um, is not up to scratch if compared with uh, with the F thirty five. Actually, the F thirty five is. Technology-wise, pretty much the most advanced aircraft today, probably the J-20 and the Russian Su-57 gets close, but probably F-35 still has a hedge. I, I mean, that sounds to me as if the, you know, sending F-16s to Ukraine is a way to kind of end of life down downstream recycling of an aircraft that almost sounds like an insult to me i mean if i was ukrainian uh, i mean it, was there ever a talk of sending f-35s to ukraine or like ukraine getting getting the most modern one and... well you you would well first you will you will have even a worse problem than the one that i explained before of actually getting to the point of being capable of using them effectively because they are more complex than the f-16s mm -hmm. And they are a less established platform, but the main problem is that you would put something which is considered to be the apex predator in the NATO arsenal in plain view of the Russians. They may end up being more effective in, I mean, having 60, 40 to 60 F-35s in Ukraine, fully operational, those could probably achieve uh, the air superiority on the whole of the operational theater. Um, if they were obviously fully operational with all the assets that need to come with them to allow them to be fully operational. Uh, problem is you would show to the Russians the your, um, your, your, your best cards, assets. everything. You're showing the cards. I mean, in, uh, I mean, you have you may have heard that many Western guided weapons starting being very effective, and then pro progressively they their effectiveness decreased. Mm -hmm. It happened with the HIMARS, it happened with the Storm Shadows, it happened with the Excalibur guided uh, artillery round. The reason why is pretty simple: the Russians see how these weapons operate, and they and then they react. A lot of the performance of 
ground-based air defenses and electronic warfare is actually driven by software. So you don't need many times to react to a new weapon. You don't need to build something completely new. You may just update the software. Mm. So, and the Russians have demonstrated to be very, very good at this. Um, it's not something that is not considered in the West, uh, but the, the Russians demonstrated to be capable of doing this very, very well. This is one of their str strong points, to be honest. Uh, so if you bring the F-35 in theater, uh, the Russian will be capable of recording their radar emissions, recording uh, their flight profiles, recording uh, the emissions of the weapons that they have, recording the communications, and uh, then the, the weapon will become less effective in case it should be used uh, in a different situation. And more or less, you may be certain if the Russians do this, the Chinese will know either. So in the light of uh, what seems to be a coming conflict in the Western Pacific, that's this is particularly important. That's the reason why you will never see the latest weapons in Ukraine. So it's not just, it's not just the NATO that kind of Okay, there's this convenient downcycling, but there's also you you still don't want to show go, give up all of your cards. NATO wants to keep a couple of technologies uh, that all the members are trained in, but that you do not yet share, even in the in a, a proxy war like Ukraine, so that you can keep that ace for later. That's your correct. analysis. That's correct. Yeah, that's that's what they're doing. Um. The, the so what is the Russian response like what are the the, the Russian Ru Russia's uh, airplanes that they are using how many of them do they use against Ukraine and do they also have an equivalent to the f-35 that they are not not using yet in order to to keep keep some secrets um so uh, the Russian Air Force um, was in good shape before the war, but not in great shape. It, it combat about in terms of combat aircraft had a, a little above a thousand, but the modern aircraft were about four hundred. Okay, and uh, the um, they have. Uh, use some older aircraft with some success as well but um definitely the uh, the number of aircraft was not that big okay if you consider the italian air forces for example a little above 100 combat aircraft so that, that, that gives you the balance the same is france is about 200 something like this so that, that gives you the the, the the dimension so the russians had Superiority. They have some technological superiority because they have some excellent pieces of um, of equipment. For example, the an air to air missile, which is the R thirty seven M, which is um, extremely very very long range weapon that outranges pretty much everything in the Western arsenal. Um, or they, or they, they, they were they, they have a particularly efficient uh, bomber force capable of launching cruise missiles, and um, which are, uh, despite what you read in some early reports, they tend to be very, very accurate and uh, very, very effective, and. It's also quite difficult to, to, to intercept and shut down. Obviously, the same element that you see, the same phenomenon that you see at uh, work from the Ukrainian side is working from the Russian side. The Russians are holding back way less than the NATO for obvious reasons. So they have given the NATO a very good look of their technology. Still, there are, uh, there is, there are at least there are a couple of uh, systems that are uh, that they are holding back. One is the Suhoi 57, which is their 
latest fifth generation aircraft, stealth aircraft, a heavy fighter, uh, actually better heavy multi-role aircraft, uh, is not being produced in large numbers because they had they still uses an, an old engine. They are waiting for a newer engine to be completely operational to start the full scale production. So they don't have many, but they don't use it too much. They just use it as a missile launcher from safe distance while inside in the, the Russian territory. So that has not been seen. The other thing, the other component that has not been seen uh, is the S-500, which is a successor of the S-400 um, that, well, is entering service now. The first test happened just uh, probably in 2021, 2022, just before the invasion, and um, but still hasn't been seen in, in, in Ukraine. This is this is for uh, the operation in Ukraine on the naval side. There is much more in terms of submarines, um, anti-ship weapons, and so on that has never been seen, and, and they are supposed to be very effective. But we don't know about that. Um, and about the the, the product production of these of these uh, weapons. Mm -hmm. I suppose that the Russians are able to do everything within within their own economy. Um, now, for the F thirty five and especially the the airplanes, is are those things purely produced inside the USA, or is part of those also sourced from other NATO countries? Is this a joint collaboration? Well, a friend of mine used to say that the F thirty five is not an aircraft; is a way of uh, exerting or uh, influencing governments <laughs> because. <laughs> Because the um, pro um, the production of the F thirty five is a Western uh, is a, is a, is a Western it is a Western world project. A lot of components are built here in the UK, not far from where I live. In um, in uh, but there are supplies all around Europe and in many other countries. In, um, however, the American have a very uh, strict control on the aircraft. Uh, the, the the key technology has are actually just Americans, and they have not been released to the to the other to the other to the other um, air forces that are actually using it. In fact, it was one of the problem problems actually caused some attrition with the Japanese, for example. And they're procuring the F-35 as well, which they wanted some technology transfer, and the Americans did not agree. <clears throat> the um, when it comes to the Russians, uh, the Russians have demonstrated to be much more autonomous than it was believed at the beginning. No, we all know that the sanctions did not um, have the effect much. one was uh, was expecting. And one of the reasons is because they, uh, the Russians, um, sort of, well, since 2014 had been planning for something like this. Uh, they still, they are still missing some key components, and the key components are the uh, is the electronic components within the within the within the weapons chips, okay, electronic chips, which are. An essential component of everything, even your mixer or your oven, actually has chips in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, in many Russian weapons, the, uh, the uh, Western components have been found. Um, however, this seems to be not a decisive problem, a crippling problem, because some of these components are of civilian derivation, mid-level sophistication components that can be bought on the open market and the sanction can be sort of uh, circumvented uh, around uh, through other, uh, other countries and middlemen that can purchase those. And the Chinese are, can actually supply a sort of lesser quality but still effective replacements of these components, which it seems that they are actually doing. We have some weaknesses in the helicopter industry, for example. They say that they, 
that with Western component they used to discard one every 15, now the Chinese they're discarding, they're discarding one every four, but still they can build helicopters. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a blocking problem, no? And um, the other, and, um, the, and the Russians have started to, uh, like it always happens when imports cease, you start having substitutions. So the Russians have launched some uh, programs to use their own uh, capabilities, their own uh, factories in the country to try replacing some of these components. And in fact, more recently, we started seeing that components, that um, Western components are now being replaced for, by Russian-made components, particularly guidance units in drones. I mean, the, the most, some of the most recent drones that have been found crashed in Ukraine had these uh, high, a slightly higher percentage of Russian components uh, than, than, than used before. The, they also started to work at strategic level in the sense they are going all in and building uh, and trying to get to I mean, the, the microcircuits factories on the on nodes, which is the terms for the level of technology, uh, on nodes that are relatively modern. Uh, then, okay, the technology, the 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 let's say the, the level of technology of microchips is the, is determined by a, a number, which is the it's called the, the node. And this node, and it is a number that sort of uh, is a proxy for the size of the components inside the chip. Mm -hmm. Most advanced components, the one that you find uh, in the MacBook that I'm using to speak uh, with you, are about three or five nanometers. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russians are doing, uh, I have a project, program to set up a, a manufacturing change for 28 nanometers which is quite old, it's probably 10, 15 years old, but is still good enough for most military applications. So they are overcoming this problem as well. Yeah, I mean, big surprise. If you if you block a country, then the country will try to find other ways of, of achieving the same thing. I mean, it's not as if though the sanction on Iran had led to Iran stopping any all and every military activity they just do them differently um maybe another question to me on my mind is like uh, talking to somebody who, who understands the technical aspects of this war is like was there anything that surprised you in the in, in the war in ukraine you know in terms of uh technical as technical uh, um devices used let's say that drone warfare became so huge and uh, that the Russians seem to have to have to not have had a lot of drones in the beginning, but then catching up very quickly, and and the way that that this new technology seems to be impacting warfare on the ground. So, well, nobody was expecting that drone technology would have had this such impact. <laughs> such an impact, it it is huge. I mean. And uh, way, way more than everyone everyone was expecting, okay? And there was also this idea that drones were not survivable uh, in a large-scale confrontation because they, there were a lot of systems around, so they were not going to survive. So they were not really usable in that context. It turned out that they are so cheap that you can actually lose them and don't worry too much about that. And don't worry too much about it. So even though they are actually not survival or little, their survivability is not that great, they are still very effective in whatever they do. But the, the other element that I think is even more important, uh, of which drone warfare is part, is the fact that the battlefield has become transparent, meaning that both sides, by drones, but also by a number of other satellites, Ukrainian through Western uh, uh, Western assets, um, space-based assets like satellites, but also ground-based assets, um, and the Russian as well, have a, such a clear picture of what the opponent is doing 
that basically you can do nothing. You can't surprise your opponent anymore. Uh, the reason, if you look at, the, if you follow the, 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 the videos that are coming from, from the war, you will often notice that all the actions involve uh, uh, small teams, maximum company level, maximum 100, 200 soldiers or a dozen vehicles, something like that. And um, this is actually not in line with the pre-war doctrine that they had, where they the idea was to amass heavy, particularly the Russian, heavy, um, uh, heavy armored formations to over to make to punch a hole through the opponent's line and and, and then operate in uh, in the rear and 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 operate in, in depth. Uh, this is not possible because every time anymore because every time you try to uh, uh, aggregate these forces to 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 create this this fist armored fist to punch through the lines, you just become a target. Mm. The, you are seen. From very from a very long distance, while you're trying to do that, the opponent gets prepared, and in the moment your forces are concentrated, they also become a better target, easier to easier to hit, and uh, uh, so your every every attempt in this direction mostly failed. The the in for example in the recent. Uh, this happened throughout all the war. It happened already at the beginning of the war. But a recent example is, for example, of Divka. The Russians lost. The Russians tried to do this kind of mass attack you know, uh, on, on, the, on the town of Avdivka. Um, and despite it, it was probably better managed than others. They managed to be to hide their preparation better than in other cases, they were absolutely pounded by the Ukrainian. They lost the equivalent of a tank division in uh, to, to conquer Avdivka. We, I'm talking probably between two and 300 vehicles, ground vehicles, um, just to conquer Avdivka, and basically because they amassed them. And the, the same happened when they tried in Buledar, and say, the same happened during the beginning of the uh, summer offensive in 2023, Ukrainian summer offensive in 2023, when they tried to use NATO doctrines and to the so, Ukrainians, yeah, Ukrainian in this <laughs> case, uh, to to try to punch through the Russian defenses. They came, they amassed their forces, and every time they amassed their forces, they were pounded, pounded to to oblivion. That's the reason why the only thing you can do is move these small teams, small groups of people that attack one position and then wait a little bit, attack another, then wait a little bit, attack another. So they slowly grinding, uh, they slowly grind through these po all these positions, but it's clear that you will never break through in this way. Will You will hardly inflict um, an operational defeat. You can, uh, you can, you can win, a lot of small tactical battles, but it's almost impossible to get an operational success, even more, any, even more so a strategic success, because basically you don't have the force. All your forces are dispersed to avoid creating targets for the opponent's systems. So that's the that's the, that, that's the element that is probably uh, the, the the key element that is changing. The, the the character of this war and mind this is different from first world war in the first world war was artillery and a machine gun and and barbed wire okay in this case is information the availability mm -hmm. of um, the availability of intelligence uh, on on the about the, the opponent's moves that makes surprise almost impossible because both sides constantly are able to surveil itself. I always thought you use like satellites to survey it, to to surveil the other guy, but so drones are just way closer. Therefore, you understand much more what's going on, and you fly them over, you know. And even if the drone is gone, you don't care. 
exactly there are several types of okay. intelligence assets some are ground based for example some uh, uh, units that actually listen to the electromagnetic emission of the opponent that is uh, an important giveaway of what is going on obviously because communications happens radar work and so on radar work try there are radars, ground-based radar, but also aircraft-based radar. The Ukrainian don't use them too much because of what we were saying before, but they also exist. NATO aircraft keep flying on the, on the Black Sea and along the borders of Ukraine and Belarus, trying to gather intelligence of what is happening. It's still a bit far. The range is not... It's, it's still a bit far, but they still gather useful intelligence. And then there is uh, obviously the, the drones, obviously, and then there is the space-based assets, of which obviously there's no lack. No, both sides don't lack the this capability. The Russians are not as developed as the Americans, uh, obviously, but um, it's enough to 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 have this kind of uh, of intelligence. Is there another piece of technology that we haven't really seen in other wars used that, or in general, another piece of technology that you are looking out or that, that you keep looking at in order to understand how the war and warfare in the 21st century is developing? If you want the big unknown is the effectiveness of electronic warfare. Mm. And cyber and cyber warfare, which is to a limited extent connected with that, in uh, this because the uh, a it is the most secret aspect of every military operations. There are very little information available, so we really don't know exactly what is going on. And uh, the the second element is that. We are so reliant, modern armies, modern, modern armed forces in general, are so reliant on the electromagnetic spectrum for uh, anything, pretty much. Communication, yeah. That the, the electromagnetic spectrum becomes a battlefield in itself. Mm. Okay? So there is a constant war going on there. And by the way, this is the situation in which you really don't want to show all your cards because it's probably the area where it is the easiest to react. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's um, so we we see the Russians that uh, actually have invested a lot in electronic warfare. This is an area where they are not inferior; they're probably slightly superior to what the West could actually deploy. Um, they have invested a lot, but still, from what we know, seem to use relatively simple and stupid brute force tactics to, to to fight in the electromagnetic spectrum. And Ukrainians don't have much to to reply with, to be honest. So, so that's that. So that's the that's the that's the problem. That's the problem, and that's the. Area where uh, some yeah some battles can be won, completely invisible battles can be won or lost and have a important influence on the events uh, of the war. And maybe a last question: uh, the West seems to have put a lot of at least narrative hope and a lot of a lot of a lot of trust capital into ever new wonder weapons so the f-16 being one and you know we need to deliver uh, this and that especially also missiles the german taurus missiles the british ones and so on and whenever they were delivered they the russians found a way to deal with them basically uh do you think that this war in the end will be decided by technology or by um military strategy um, which one do you think is more decisive 
I mean, because like uh, one thing is the Second World War. At the end of the Second World War, we've seen the introduction of something we've never seen before, which is an atomic bomb, a nuclear bomb. And although, in my view, Russia's entry into the Second World War was more decisive for the Japanese to give up, the, 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 the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were very important for the, for the emperor to actually justify giving up toward its own people. Um, so the, the, the sheer fact that you have a new technology can matter also politically. Um, do we, is there anything that, that, that you know that, that is being developed at the moment in, in terms of very new technology? In, so let's uh, split between the, the general situation in the view of a future conflict with China possibly, and the war in Ukraine. So in terms of general situation, there's a lot of this being developed today. Hypersonics, um, a new generation of combat aircraft, uh, drones, uh, UCAVs, so unmanned, com unmanned command uh, vehicles, uh, unmanned combat vehicles, sorry, that, that is a system that can actually drones that can actually use weapons while not being guided oh. by a human to a limited yeah. extent plenty of problems there but not there yet but that's the direction where they're going and one that is ha hardly talked about is integration communication and intelligence integration so every system on the battlefield can share its information with every other system and every system, every or, or every soldier or, or every airman or every or every sailor in the theater has a picture of the situation that is uh, composed by the uh, by the the the, 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 sing, the the individual views of every of every system. Uh, this is exactly what is happening in Ukraine. When I was mentioning before, which is, and it is still probably to a relatively primitive level there are studies to push this to the max and capable of doing of, for example controlling a an air battle from the other side of the world uh, and even commanding directly the, the weapons involved so there's a lot being doing that and this is in general on the general from the general point of view uh all about the war in ukraine because nobody wants to give away all the cards, I don't think that we are likely to see uh, real military solutions. In the sense, we may get to the point that, as it seems now, can always overturn because of political decision. But as we see now, it seems that the Russians may get to the point of almost breaking the Ukrainian forces. And then I believe that at that stage, rather than accepting the, rather than uh, the, rather than accepting the breakage and losing, for example, the entire country, as of the Dnieper, they will start three, they, 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 will, they, they will sit down and negotiate. Uh, so I don't expect a full military solution in uh, in Ukraine, but due to any particular technology but i but there are plenty of technologies being developed today that that i mean the, the next war we always hope that it will be none but yeah the next war uh will still be different from from this one won't be won't be similar okay i've learned from you today that uh, obviously even though this war in ukraine is being the most horrible one in europe for you know, at least since the Yugoslav Wars, uh, apparently still not everything is being used there and um, technology is being developed, uh, which means I have to talk to you again. Uh, I hope I hope not too soon. I hope not too soon. I really would wish these, these instruments not being used. Just we are too dumb not to use them. That's what frustrates me so much. It's an 8 billion planet and we are not smart enough not, not to use this instrument of slaughter on each other, but well. Um, Unfortunately, what happens? The fact that I follow this doesn't mean that I am yeah. a warmonger, obviously. No, I know, I know. 
you're you're a, you're a very uh, a reasonable person and on your channel by the way everybody uh, gus keeps talking about these systems and about the technical intricacies that uh, i i believe um that people on the ground will be studying and and that 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 are impactful so we also in the policy space we should we should at least know uh, bits of it so um gus thank you very much for sharing your knowledge today my pleasure it was uh, really interesting all the links will be again in the description and also to your, your channel. Um, all the best. Thank you very much. See you soon.